Good afternoon, um, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sangmani Labut. Um, I am the program manager here at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, for accessibility description, I am an Asian male um, with short hair and wearing glasses. So the University of Minnesota Spotlight Series is a collaborative partnership of the um, Institute for Advanced Study, the university's honors program in Northrop to present lectures, panel discussions, um, exhibits, and other events throughout the academic year around, topic, uh, t around timely topic um, of interest. The six part series um, of um, 2011 and 2022 hosted in partnership with the uh, Minnesota Humanities Center um, focuses on reconsidering patriotism, public service, and civic engagement. So before we begin um, today, I want to acknowledge that um, wherever you are um, here on campus or with us online, we are located on traditional um, ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus resides on Dakota land seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and later layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the many ways um, we, in which we worked to educate the campus community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. The IAS Northrop University Honors Program are committed to um, ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Um, it's my pleasure today um, to introduce um, our guests. Um, Anastasia Belladonna Carrera is the Executive Director for Common Cause Minnesota. Anastasia previously worked as Legislative um, Director for the Minnesota State Agency the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs, or MCLA. MCLA advises and informs the governor's office, legislative branch, and community stakeholders on matters of importance to Latino Minnesotans. She was um, responsible for developing legislative strategy and mapping out action items for MCLA to infuse the Latino lens and voices into the policy making arena at all levels of government in Minnesota. Prior to joining the Minnesota Council on, on Latino Affairs, Anastasia held various um, leadership roles within local, state, and federal government, working closely with diverse Minnesota communities, partners, and stakeholders. Her equity-focused areas in government include participatory um, democracy and race relations. And our next speaker who's joining us um, virtually um, is uh, Miles Rappaport. Um, Miles Rappaport is a longtime organizer, policy advocate, election of, and election official. He is um, currently the senior fellow at the Ash Center at Harvard. Um, he brings four years of experience working to strengthen democracy and democratic and democratic institutions in the, in the United States. Prior to his appointment um, to the Ash Center, um, Rappaport was most recently president of the independent um, grassroots organization, Common Cause. For 13 years, he headed the Public Policy Center as Demos, um, and Rappaport previously served as Connecticut's um, Secretary of State and a state legislature for 10 years in Hartford, Connecticut. He has written, spoken, organized um, widely on issues of American democracy. Um, he was a member of Harvard class 1971. So please help me welcome our esteemed panelists. Um, but before we get further into the program, I want to offer you all um, some few technical instructions for our audience members. We do have um, a captioner working with us today. Um, our online viewers can um, enable captions by clicking on the closed caption or live transcription button commonly located on the bottom Zoom menu bar um, if you are on a desktop computer. Or on the top right menu um, if you are using a mobile device and then select show subtitles. <laughs> 
And for today, um, we are using um, Slido to facilitate audience Q&A. Um, you can submit questions um, anytime um, during our program. Attendees can use their smartphones. Um, you can either scan the QR code displayed on your screen or go to www.slido.com and enter the code um, Spotlight Series. And so Zoom um, attendees, please check the um, chat um, frequently for our direct link to our Slido page. Um, and please note that questions can be submitted um, anonymously. And it does have um, a 160 character limit as well. And so we encourage you to um, upvote any previous um, submitted questions to ensure that we address questions based on the audience um, um, interest um, today. And so now without um, further delay, our moderator today um, for the Spotlight Series and for the Spotlight Series is Kevin Lindsay. Um, Kevin is CEO of the Minnesota, Min Minnesota Humanities Center. He is a widely respected advocate and lawyer with a wealth of experience in public policy and education reform. A proven um, change maker, Kevin's career focuses on finding solutions to complex issues um, for institutions. He has um, a passion for inclusion for all, um, building a stronger democracy, and leveraging power of the personal stories. Um, Kevin has held numerous governmental and nonprofit positions, um, such as a board chair and interim director of Walker. West Museum Academy, and most recently, I'm serving as the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Rights from 2011 to 2019. And thanks, Kevin. Take it away. Much for that uh, warm introduction, and I appreciate everybody joining us in the conversation today. We have two outstanding guests. And I can think of uh, no other person really to be talking about what's going on in Minnesota than my guest and friend to my right. And I'm also very excited that we were fortunate to have Miles Rappaport join us as well because his uh, new book and some of the work that he has been doing at the national level I think is incredibly important for us also to be uh, knowledgeable about. But let's start first in Minnesota. Uh, so, Anastasia, is there anything kind of going on here in the state of Minnesota? Everyone, thank you so much for joining me. Those of you that are on, on, online, welcome to the discussion. Wow, did you really start with that? Um, absolutely. So just to give you, we're going to get into more details, but just to give you a little bit of a sense of what's happening right here at home, in the House, in the Minnesota State House alone, there are currently close to 200 bills that have been introduced so far as of today that in some way, shape, or form impact elections and how folks engage and experience the act of voting. On the Senate side, we have pretty much about the same number of bills. And as we're going to discuss as the evening goes on here, um, they as well deal with elections and how you're going to be experiencing um, the casting of your ballot. Um, it's a no-brainer, right? It should be fairly easy. But it has become one of the most contentious issues um, at our capital within the context of Minnesota's cultural sort of pride in being either one or two always with voter turnout, always leading in civic engagement. It's a point that we are really proud about here in Minnesota. But um, we never thought that some of the policies that are coming into the state through our elected officials, can I repeat that? Through our elected officials. This is not something that's just falling from the sky and nobody knows about. This is something that is being moved by individuals that we are voting into office. And that introduces a whole new layer. So I want to sort of leave this part of what I wanted to share and how we kick off the evening with the following. What is democracy? We say it a lot, but what is it? 
And when we talk about an inclusive, accountable, transparent democracy, who are we talking about? Who is experiencing a transparent, accountable, and inclusive democracy? Knowing that you uh, were at the state capitol, um, that number about 200, just to kind of put into context for folks, uh, and I would share from my perspective and time there, that's roughly back of the envelope, about one out of every 20 bills. That seems like an astounding amount on, on any particular issue. Was there something that you think is, quote unquote, in the water here in, in our many lakes that's really driving the number of, of bills uh, being proposed at the legislature? Yeah. So the question that I let you all sort of think about as you're listening to both myself and Miles um, explore this general area and topic with you this evening, what we're talking about is who's driving it and what is being driven within the context and umbrella of democracy. So that presumes that we have a democracy, a, a system of democracy that's experienced in the same way by everyone. And that's our first problem. Not all Minnesotans experience democracy in the same way. Not all Minnesotans experience what it's like to be represented by an elected official with common values, with common right, concerns or aspirations. There are two, I would argue, democracies in our country right now that have always been that way. It's just that since 2010, I would argue, with the Red Map Project and redistricting, for those of you that are not familiar with redistricting, it's literally the reshaping of our voting maps at all levels of government, from congressional seats all the way to city council, school board, park boards, and that's important because that is literally the foundation to the power of your vote. That means that I could manipulate as an elected official, and in Minnesota, it's our politicians that have the job of drawing those district maps, right? And so I have the ability to move my agenda, not my constituents' agenda, right? And that applies to both sides of the partisan aisle. This is not something unique to a particular side of the partisan um, camps at the Capitol right now. So that's really important to understand and know because I have the ability to silence some voices while unfairly amplifying others through that redistricting process, through my ability to shape and move and pick the voters that I want in my district, right? Why is that important? Um, for some of us that have not... Um <laughs> lived in election law as much. You made mention of this fact of like every 10 years mm -hmm. and then the legislature having that, that responsibility. Could you give us a little bit of a primer 101? Sure. Just sort of on that process. And then I think also share what happened in Minnesota, which might have been the exception as opposed to the, the proposed rule. Yes. So for those of you that may not be familiar, it happens every 10 years because it happens right after the census. And without getting too wonky into the census, I think many of us are familiar that the census is used to count Minnesotans so that at a federal level, then Minnesota gets its fair share of resources, whether it's money or any other types of resources, right? And so we want to make sure that we have a complete count. What other folks, though, may not be familiar with as much, because it's not discussed, I think, as much, is that it's also used to divvy out power. It's used to give... Uh, the U.S. House of Representatives has 435 seats, period. So think of it as this auditorium. That's it. And so the U.S. government, the federal government, has to figure out a way of fairly allocating how many of these seats is going to go to what state. And that's based on your population. So some of you might have heard that Minnesota was able to keep its 8th congressional district by only, I think it was less than 24, something like that odd number, seats to New York. New York was going to take our 8th congressional seat. But in Minnesota, because of the BIPOC community's turnout, we were able to keep that seat by 27-ish or so 
counted people in the state of Minnesota. That's important. Remember who I just said. In the state of Minnesota, our state demographer has routinely stated that it's the BIPOC population, individuals of color and indigenous individuals to the state of Minnesota in their birth rates that have kept up that seat for the state because birth rates for non-BIPOC members in the state of Minnesota have been going down while death rates have been going up, right? And I just talked about power. So because of BIPOC turnout at the census, we kept that eighth congressional seat. The question then becomes, what did they get for that? as far as equitable representation at our state and in our congressional level. So this happens every 10 years. We are able to have eight, right, in the House, congressional members based on our population count. Again, it's important because to my question about who saved that seat and what does that mean about representation, we start off by saying who's enjoying that democracy and where is that representation. Well, in the state of Minnesota, Common Cause led a coalition with Voices of Racial Justice and with 1MN.org, which is a BIPOC statewide coalition space. And for the first time in Minnesota's history, we successfully filed a legal intervener in the redistricting process because the legislature failed to put people first. And so the courts, for the sixth time now, that's 60 years we've been living under voting maps that are 60 years old. They're not new. They're based on voters from 60 years ago, not who we are today or who we're moving towards in the future, right? So it arrests equitable representation of everyone living in the state of Minnesota, not just the predominant white communities and voters in Minnesota. We sued to make sure that people of color had an equitable stakeholder position at the litigation table. Again, never done before in the state of Minnesota. And because of that, while we did not move the needle as much as we wanted to, we were able, and I don't know if you heard it in the news, we were able to make sure that minimally the five largest tribes in the state of Minnesota up in central northern Minnesota finally had some equitable representation from a congressional and state level. Time for me to bring in Miles into the conversation. And just to follow this, some of you might have been reading your newspaper, or you might have seen a story where your state representative or state senator had their district redrawn. So she might now need to uh, run in a different race or might have uh, two members of the legislature competing against each other. This is kind of this process every 10 years that the state goes through redrawing these respective uh, districts. Miles, um, Anastasia kind of teed up one of these questions that comes up when we talk about redrawing. Uh, I think Chief Justice Roberts likes us now to call it gerrymandering, but a lot of us talked about gerrymandering uh, when I was in law school. So to this extent, uh, could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges at, at the national level on gerrymandering or gerrymandering as a case may be? Are you able to hear us? All right, there we go. I, I apologize for the delay. I was trying to unmute myself, so here, but here I am. Um, well, I actually think Chief Justice Roberts sort of has the pronunciation battle correctly because uh, um, we had Elbridge, Elbridge Gary was the governor of Massachusetts for whom gerrymandering or gerrymandering is, uh, is named. Uh, we're not really proud of that, as a, I say that as a Massachusetts um, fellow at the Kennedy School, but, uh, but there it is. Um, it's interesting, and I, I was uh, impressed. Uh, uh, Anastasia, let me say hello to you. Very glad to meet you as a former Common Cause person myself. I was delighted to listen to you. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of, of uh, gerrymandering, I was, uh, Pleased to hear you talk about Operation Red Map because it really was a, a kind of watershed moment back in 2010 when 
um, you know, the there was a Republican wave, um, and uh, you know, legislative control shifted to the Republicans in many many states, and that was followed by a real effort to uh, shift the maps in a in a partisan direction. Uh, I should say, I think it's important to say, as a kind of a, a scholar of democracy and not as a partisan, um, both parties do gerrymandering. Uh, it is a kind of natural feature of the process that if you have political control, you want to try to help cement it. But it is true that begin that after the 2010 elections, there was a real sweep of changes that were tremendously to the advantage of the of the Republican Party. Um, it's interesting. We are in the we're still in the middle of the redistricting process now, as Anastasia correctly said. It's not clear how it's going to end up. Most of the predictions right now are that in the congressional um, apportionment, um, it'll probably be something of a wash or perhaps even a couple of pro-democratic states. But I do think that, um, you know, that it is we really need to have fairly drawn districts. Uh, some of the states, California is kind of the most notable, have independent citizen commissions that draw the lines. Uh, they take the, legis the partisan legislators out of the process and quite successfully in, uh, in California and a number of other states, lines have been drawn that fairly represent the population and which have bipartisan support. So uh, gerrymandering is one of the issues that we face in our democracy. There are a number of others, including the whole issue of voter participation itself. But I think there is a way forward, and that is to do as much as we can transfer the decision-making power to independent redistricting commissions. And I think there's both precedent and some momentum for that as we go forward. Um, what you're saying about uh, additional issues out there. And when we think about fair districts, I wanna underscore this point is that it can be a toss up district where it's not clear which political party is going to win the district. And for citizens, that gives them a greater opportunity to kind of shape and mold conversations and issues with the candidates. Um, and that's important within democracy. Um, you, you talked or you hinted at some other issues which you uh, are aware of and, and kind of the national debate. And I know some of your work with the academy. Um, what is going on in that space and, and taking a look at election law issues? Uh, I want to I want to detour for just a second, Kevin, to do a little bit of an homage to the to the people of Minnesota, uh, having been Secretary of the State in uh, Connecticut. Um, I have long been uh, impressed and a fan of what Minnesota has done in terms of its democracy. Um, Anastasia is right; Minnesota has always been, um, you know, the very top at the in terms of political. Uh, turnout, citizen participation. Uh, you've had some excellent secretaries of the state whom I know personally from Joan Grove, and Mary Kiffmeyer, Mark Ritchie, and your current secretary, Steve Simon, is a, a real advocate for voting rights. Um, I've been a friend and fan of Keith Ellison, your attorney general, for a long time. And Cecily Hines, who was my co-worker at the Ash Center, has been a prominent uh, uh, figure in, in uh, nonprofit world in the, in the state. So, and you've had, by the way, I was a major promoter, both at Common Cause, but before that at Demos of same day voter registration. And Minnesota was one of the very first states in the country to establish same day registration. So, and I think that has a lot to do with all of that. So I'm a big fan of the history of Minnesota. Don't, don't, don't go backwards, please, Minnesota. Uh, keep going forward. I think this is good. I will say though, that in terms of the other issues, I think, uh, I'll do a very short uh, schema, which is I think that the country has two sets of, uh, of, of issues. One are longstanding structural issues that have hindered the fullest participation and the fullest flowering of democracy, gerrymandering being one of them. Um, you know, the, the, the problem of money in politics and the dominance of, of large donors in the, in the, in the process, making um, you know, ordinary citizens count for less. Uh, is a problem. I think our low turnout, again, Minnesota being kind of the exception, but, uh, but not a full exception. The United States trails behind almost all other major industrialized countries in the basic level of turnout. And partly that's because we've had a long contested history of moving forward to expand the franchise and attempts to restrict the franchise. Uh, 
Um, so I think that, you know, it's important for us to deal with those long-term structural issues. I'm gonna come back to one of them as I've just written a book about it. Um, but we also have the new challenges, the things that Anastasia was describing, both in Minnesota, but in states around the country, of people looking to do two things. One, make it harder for people to cast the vote. Um, uh, voters, that's the term of art for that is voter suppression. Um, and then, but the second part is to replace nonpartisan election administration um, with partisan, um, you know, people who are looking to enshrine minority rule at any cost. And that, the, the term of art for that is election subversion. So we have bills for both voter suppression and election, election subversion uh, that are advancing in states around the country. And they really, it's a really troubling, uh, troubling moment when we see that happening. Uh, but I'm an optimist and I believe that there is really excellent pushback against those bills. And I think we'll see many of them pushed back um, both in Minnesota and elsewhere. Half of uh, the four Secretary of States, we, we thank you <laughs> for that. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate too how you laid out a couple of different buckets for us to think about some of these election um, pieces of legislation that are moving through not just in Minnesota, but all throughout the respective country. Uh, Anastasia, I want to come back because we left you and you were just ready to talk about some litigation which had been going on in the state of Minnesota. If you could bring us up to date as to what's going on in that space. Litigation front, um, with regards to uh, the redistricting process itself, on February the 15th, the court, the Minnesota Supreme Court, released the official um, maps, congressional maps and state maps for the state of Minnesota. Um, we have been thinking about uh, potentially appealing that to the Minnesota Supreme Court, uh, and I'm not gonna get into the weeds of, of what the legalities are and like what particular principles there are, but we, suffice it to say, feel it's important enough to really challenge the process itself. To Miles' point, um, in Minnesota, because the court steps in if the legislative body fails to move bipartisan maps. And by the way, in Minnesota, that's done as with any other bills. So just as you hear the controversies behind a bill getting stuck in committee or a bill, you know, the chair, you know, laying it over for possible inclusion and then killing it on the spot, you know, the same dynamics that you see with any other bill is the same path that you see move with the redistricting plans in Minnesota. So um, the courts don't post the maps to get any kind of public input. There's no way to hold the courts accountable from, by the public. Like we can't say, well, who drew the maps? Who consulted? Who was in the room when that happened? None of that transparency and accountability is in place for the courts. The most important part to really signal is that Although a lot of people say, oh, let the courts do it. How can they possibly be biased? How can they possibly gerrymander? Well, the problem with that is that with the courts, their role is not to represent constituents in this process. The court, the five judge panel that's appointed by the Supreme Court does not sit there and look at maps and say, hmm, do these maps fairly and equitably represent the constituents living in these districts? No, the only thing the court is looking at is to see if there are any unconstitutional issues, any constitutional issues that any of the parties, any of the litigants are bringing forward that need to be addressed, that's it. They don't sit there and that's why we have maps that are 60 over 60 years old. They have the same base map and all they do is a tweak a little bit on the edges, right? So we're literally living under those 60 year old maps without really being fairly and equitably represented. So from the courts, from that perspective, we're still sort of toying with that, not sure where we're gonna land on that specifically. At a local level right now, currently, Minneapolis just moved its city ward uh, maps and so did St. Paul. There was a lot of shiny things offered to the public in the forefront of it, but when it came down to actually voting for it, they did so behind closed doors with no public notice whatsoever. So we are diving into litigation. 
on both that. As a matter of fact, this evening, as I sit here, my staff is getting ready to walk folks through the Minneapolis map and the St. Paul map so they understand the ramifications of what's happening on that front. That's just from like that part. On the other side of that, if y'all remember when we had the COVID um, adjustments to some of the rules and some of the deadlines, et cetera, coming from the Secretary Office of the Secretary of State, trying to make sure that you know ballots were accessible and readily available to all and every uh, all and every uh, eligible Minnesotan. If you remember, there was there were like some things that a group, uh, some legislators in partnership with some of the local conservative think tanks like Americans for Prosperity is one of the groups, filed a lawsuit suing Office of the Secretary of State with regards to the constitutionality and the legality of the Office of the Secretary of State making those adjustments to make sure that people were able to do. Most of you hopefully heard that the bulk of them were um, uh, affirmed except for one. And that's why last go around in 2020, we had um, to separate the presidential, the, the, in Minnesota we separated the ballots for the presidential ele election and then the ballot for local elections, right? They weren't all tallied at once because any ballots for the president coming in after, uh, I think it was the three o'clock on the election day had to be put aside because the court reverted the lower court's decision and said, nah, uh, uh you can't extend that. It has to be submitted by three o'clock of the absentee ballots in order to be counted. So in Minnesota, that meant that had Biden, as just as an example, had Biden not won by the margin that he did and that it was a shorter margin, that might have been a really controversial thing because then that meant that the state had to go back and weed out all of those ballots, right? They were separated, they were never counted, but I'm just saying that that's just how important. And if you remember that, that came in two days before election day. So there was no way for us or the Office of the Secretary of State or election officials to let people who had already casted their ballot know that your ballot was now possibly not gonna get counted because it wasn't turned in by that particular time. We anticipate more litigation this year. We're gonna anticipate, given the fervor in the Senate, by the Senate uh, leadership, and also because we have two key senators running. We have Senator Benson who's running um, on the Republican ticket, and we also have Senator Gazelka, Paul Gazelka running. Now, Paul Gazelka was the previous Senate Majority Leader, and Senator Benson has been the chair of one of the most powerful committees in the Senate, which is HHS, right? Health and Human Services, Act, the general committee for that. And so both of them, although it was Senator Benson who penned it, have essentially penned sort of what I would depict as, and maybe Miles has a better way of describing this, but I would call it the baby version of every voter suppressive bill that we've seen run in Texas, Georgia, um, Michigan, I mean, I'm trying to, Wisconsin for sure. You know, I'm trying to think of every bill you can think of that you've read or heard about in the news happening in other states. Well, now that's all being put here in Minnesota and it's being put here under the guise of election integrity and protecting voting rights, right? So we saw a 2012 move, constitutional amendment to put f voter photo ID on the ballot that was defeated by everyday Minnesotans. Everyday Minnesotans, regardless of your party affiliation, had the ability to go and vote. They voted, they did not want it. And ever since 2012, we've had the Senate majority move a voter photo ID and provisional ballots because they want to get rid of, sorry Miles, they want to get rid of same day voter registration. They want to get rid of voting, you know, being able to vouch for the voter, right? This is something that's been moved by Senator Kiffmeyer, Mary Kiffmeyer, and I'm talking facts here, folks. I'm not talking, you know, partisan dynamics here. Senator Mary Kiffmeyer is out and proud. She is the ALEC Minnesota representative. And we can talk about who ALEC is in a bit, but let's just say that ALEC is deep money, dark money, funded by predominantly the Koch brothers, right? as an engine of putting out these, you know, um, in the democracy space anyway, very suppressive bills. And what they do is that they find the, they establish relationships through like this membership group, 
and they find they work with elected officials who then become their sort of their agents and moving these suppressive you know policies at a state level minnesota since the 2016 election has become more and more of ground zero when it comes to these types of hyper partisan efforts because we have historically been such a purpley kind of state where you know in the national scene minnesota is sort of like the place where people look at to see what's best practices that are coming out right and since i anyway took office uh, with common cause minnesota in 2016 it's been all defense 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 like i haven't been able to budge much because Senator Kiffmeyer has essentially refused to move with an elections omnibus bill. And that's how you get pro-democracy or any kind of elections and democracy bills out of the Senate. You need to have a Senate companion bill or vehicle to move those policies. She has essentially like nipped it. Ever since she has been in her position in the Senate, her only job has been to stop any kind of elections bill unless she wants it, and you know what those look like. So you gave us a couple of juicy tidbits. <laughs> so I'd like to go back just a little bit. I also want to remind the audience that if you have any questions, please send those to me. I'll make sure that your question gets put for Anastasia or to Miles. Uh, the first bit that you gave us, I want to come back to it because it ties to something you said uh, concerning five indigenous tribes within Minnesota. So the, the maps haven't changed for an appreciable amount of time. And when we talk about representation and how we have talked about representation today has been uh, our binary kind of political party system. And there's more than Republicans and Democrats within the state. But there's another way in which you can look at this. And that is where there's concentration of BIPOC communities districts can be divided in a way such that those BIPOC communities' ability to elect somebody is diluted. How has the state been on that issue? That's a really good point. So I think in general, there's a philosophy out there about why, do, you know, why is the metro, and I'll again speak to just Minnesota, why are metropolitan areas more democratic or blue-leaning as voters um, and why more of the rural sort of exurb areas more uh, Republican or red leaning or more conservative, I'll just say more conservative in um, some of the positions. And there's, a, there's one thought that says that that's because they're more educated and the more educated you are, the more liberal or moderate you tend to be, right? And then another one has to say, well, that's because that's where like all the center. And so you get packed in because people are going to, um, they go to metropolitan areas or more metro areas to access resources, right? And so if you're trying to access resources and you're coming from a specific kind of socioeconomic background, and therefore you're going to be voting in a certain way to support certain policies that tend to lean more in one direction versus another, et cetera. Now, I'm not gonna like. I'm not gonna speak to which which of those two sides is correct, um, but I will say this: what you're talking about, um, Kevin, is the is part of some a series of ways through gerrymandering. And remember, I said gerrymandering is a way that elected officials pick their voters instead of voters picking the elected official, right? So I use data and information available to me that I buy from other sources or that other sources just volunteer and give me while I'm drawing my district map that helps me get so close to knowing how that house voted in the last several election cycles, right? And that's important because if I have a district, say District A, and I am a person in District A. Mind you, remember, district maps are 10 years long, right? So say that when we started in District A, that district was more Republican. And, you, and this example goes for Democrats too, by the way. In fact, let's just use Democrats. It's Democrat, right? But here we are now, at the end of the decade, new census information is out. And I'm learning that I'm a Republic, I'm a Democrat representing this area, District A, and I'm learning that my constituents are more conservative. So that means 
that 10 years, in 10 years span, my constituents went from predominantly being Democrats, independents that related to me, to being now more conservative, possibly Republican, maybe not relating to me as much, right? So I have the power now to basically dilute them, dilute their power by what we call cracking them, which is taking a concentrated community that is predominantly people of color and then, or a particular party, and then breaking them up into separate districts so that they don't have a collective political power and the ability to elect someone that they can relate to that will push for them. Or I can pack them, which is putting them into the point where you have a candidate now, and I can cite to various little areas here, um, <laughs> well, and, where, and, and where they're right, the margin of, of the margin of their um, election win and turnout is huge. So I only need 51 to win, but I'm going to get my district by 70 and 80 percent. So what does that mean for all those other people that turned out to vote? It's kind of wasted because, you know, I'm all of my voters are packed into one area, which, again, impacts whether they're not going to come back the next cycle around. Raise a, an excellent point about cracking, right? So this is when folks are looking at these maps for districts, and instead of being a circle or a square or some um, geometric uh, geometric image that we might have recognized in second or third grade, all of a sudden they go all in sorts of different directions. Um, I, you talked about uh, competitive election elective races in Minnesota. And again, um, this challenge of having an appreciable number of those districts and how that impacts uh, how democracy plays out. There is a question, and um, it says, I'm curious what you might think about Minnesota's caucus system in terms of voter access and fairness with this overlay. Miles talked about systems and structures and how you know, these structures have an impact on how people experience their democracy. Remember we started again, I'm gonna keep that theme going. How do people experience democracy in the state of Minnesota? More importantly, who are those people experiencing democracy? Who is it accountable? Who is it transparent? Who is it inclusive for, right? That I see bubbling up in this caucus discussion, right? Not getting too much into the partisan aspects of that, but if it's, it's something that I hear a lot of complaints around as people engage me around maybe a better system, a better structure, a better way about it, because partisan platforms are fed or, sh or are supposed to be fed through that structure of the caucus systems, right? And, and through the resolutions that are moved and through who shows up, right? So you hear a lot of people talking about, if you care, and I'll just use my own experience, if you care about redistricting, then let's mobilize into the primaries and all their, their, you know, their caucus dynamics, and let's find some members to show up that are gonna really advocate and lobby for this redistricting resolution. And so you move, you find folks that show up, and the more people that show up, with the same kind of resolution, the more likely it is it gets pecked up to the next layer, right? But then, you know, it's those, and that is partisan. Then you get into those nuances of who are those influencers, right? What do they look like? Do they look like the people that are impacted or not? And I think that that's something that I hear a lot in both sides, like from both, we, by the way, Common Cause Minnesota has like over 18,000 members across the state. We have Republican members, we have Democratic, we, we, you know, you name it. I think the newer ones that we're picking up are for the marijuana party, but you know, we do have slightly more DFL that have self-identified members than we do Republicans, but we have a lot of Republicans in our base as well. And it's something I hear from them as well, the frustration that I hear from them as well, because there are Republicans that are of color. There are Democrats that are of color, and yet each side sort of Racially, the vote is being racialized, I feel, now more than before. And this feeds into the caucus process because on the DFL side, I hear a lot of folks that are from communities that are disparately impacted by some of these policies because they don't experience democracy in the same way, right? And they're frustrated because they feel like a particular party 
racialize their participation to the extent that if they need door knockers, they're there. If they need envelope stuffers, they're there. In other words, if they need a frontline person, they're there. But when it comes to that hierarchy and those positions of power within the caucus structure, they're missing. And if they are there, they're there in a tokenizing kind of way where you have the title, and I'm just gonna make this up for purposes of the example, although it was a real example a while, a while ago. I'm Anastasia, I will have the title of cam you know, field campaign director for a particular party and I'm the right color, I have the right background, I have the right education, I have the right people skills. But when I come to the table, right, of the higher ups and present a grassroots campaign that appropriately allocates resources and, and allocates methodologies and brings in people and puts, a, it's like, oh, wait a minute, no, no, no. You know, that's just a little too much peanut butter right now. We have to really think about this other thing over here, right? And so in that sense, I think the caucus system is failing to keep with much like to Miles' point on a national scale. I think our democracy is failing to keep up with the demographics, with the socioeconomics behind who that institution was created for, um, and is it still working? I am that one person who's gonna rock your boat right now and tell you that our hearings should be like a little bit like town halls instead of spaces at a sacred capital where no one can go to that's affected by it because you're working two and three jobs. Let's face it, if you're an elected member at the capital, it's because you're wealthy enough to be able to have that part-time position and not rock your family's existence too much. If you're at the Capitol and I'm bumping into you, you're either Kevin in his position and you're Anastasia, the part-time lobbyist, or you're somebody who's paid to be there. That's a different layer of the onion, right? Who's actually crafting policies that are given to legislators? Is it community? Do legislators go back through town halls and lawn parties and everything else they did when they asked you for their vote? Did they also come back to you and say, hey, Redistricting is happening in Minnesota. How do you want your district shaped? Do you know what it is? How do you want it shaped? How do you, what are the spaces in your district that you care about? Did they do that? I don't know, but I sure saw a lot of them with these little lawn party cute things and masks on. COVID wasn't enough to stop them for that. But when you ask them, did you consult your, they'll tell you this. Well, constituents told me, and you know, you know Kevin, you know me, right? I'm in, I'm in the galley saying, name them. Name me three. Document it. I bet you can't, because how do you know? How do I know, Kevin, that they actually spoke to these people? Or is it just the people on their donors list? Or is it just the people on their emailing list because they're lobbying them? Ooh, I can, ooh, we can go down that route for a minute. You got me all excited with that question. <laughs> Um, Miles, you um, have the pleasure uh, on our panel of being the only person who has the title of Secretary of State. So I want to ask you questions about election fraud. So there have been some um, articles, there have been some comments within kind of the public dis square, public discourse about election fraud. When we think of election fraud occurring in the United States, what is actually happening when people are saying, from a Secretary of State's perspective, from a court's perspective, what's election fraud? Well, the the uh, the definition that is usually applied um, is when if if a voter goes and um, votes in someone else's name, or pretends that they're they're ineligible to vote but they're not. Um, you know, the truth is there's almost none of that in the United States. That's the true fact. This has been studied. This has been investigated by secretaries of the state, by attorneys general, by commissions, et cetera. The amount of, of, of fraud in the sense of voters uh, improperly voting in some way, voting in the wrong place, voting with the wrong, without, with a, a fake ID, et cetera, is, um, is infinitesimal. Uh, so, the question then becomes, well, why do we hear so much about it if it's a non-problem? 
And here's where I would like to, I wanna go back to the 20, 2018 and 2020 elections. The tw well, let's just talk about 2020. 2020, I mean, we, you know, the, the pall that has been cast over the 2020 elections by the, you know, the, by the, the, um, the lie, I'll just say it as it is, you know, that the election was somehow stolen or that there were, you know, there's all kinds of fraud and malfeasance, um, you know, has been, has overshadowed the, the, um, the results of the 2020 election in the process. But the truth is the 2020 election was quite a marvel if you think about it. Here we were in the middle of a, of a pandemic um, where people couldn't, you know, go out to vote. They couldn't, you know, go out, go home, to, go out to register. I mean, there were all kinds of incredible problems. And what happened was secretaries of the state and local election officials and county clerks around the country, uh, you know, made adjustments, opened up the process, did more mail-in voting, did more early voting, um, you know, put up, put up more drop boxes. In some places they had curbside voting, in some places they had 24 hour voting, all ways to make voting more possible given, the, given that. And there we were in 2020 under the most difficult of circumstances and we had the largest turnout ever in an American election. 161 million people voted uh, that was 66.2 or 66.6, .6, depending on how you talk about it, uh, percent of the electorate. That's extraordinary. That was actually should have been celebrated, um, should have been by everyone to say, you know what, democracy uh, and our election officials came through with flying colors. And instead, what's happened is, and the bills that Anastasia mentioned that are coming in Minnesota and coming in other places, instead, are you know the 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 um, the um, specter of voter fraud and voter integrity and that the elections can be stolen are being raised in order to restrict the vote. And this goes back to what I said earlier of the long and contested history of one on the one hand trying to expand the vote and have a fully inclusive democracy, and on the other hand trying to enshrine minority rule by any means necessary. And we are absolutely seeing that, and it's. It's really a shame. So as Secretary of the State, as someone who knows other Secretary of the State, and by the way, I wanna say there, is, there are numbers of Republican Secretaries of State around the country who did an outstanding job of getting encouraging people to vote. So this is not simply, let's throw partisan darts. The question is whether you believe that people should vote and have the opportunity to vote and make it possible for people to vote, or whether you're wanting trying to make it harder for people to vote in order to gain a partisan advantage. And I think that that second course of action is, is really illegitimate, but unfortunately we're seeing it all around the country, um, et cetera. So uh, the, the short answer to voter fraud is, uh, the fraud is, that's being perpetrated is the fact that the elections were somehow compromised in 2020, they were not. They were the fairest, largest per turnout elections under adverse circumstances that we could have had and people, should be ashamed of themselves if they're promoting the idea that somehow the elections were flawed and we have to we have to rein in on on voter fraud, which time after time has been disproven in any significant degree. Come back to you, Anastasia. There's a couple of questions um, about the census and the 60 year voting maps. Uh, one of the questions, how do the 10 year census driven maps versus many Minnesota 60 year voting maps, how are they interrelated and how do they impact determination of districts? That's a good question because it allows me to make the distinction that I think is super important. The use of the census is key to informing the shaping of those maps because there are certain constant federally required constitutional laws that say the following. At a congressional level, when you're drawing those congressional districts, so in Minnesota we have eight, we need to make sure that as feasibly as possible, District 1 and District 2 have no more than one, and I'm being literal here because that's how it's laid out in the Constitution, have no more than one person difference as reasonably as possible, right? And that's important. Because if District 1 has, say, 500,000, I'm just making this up, 500,000 people living in it, and District 2 has, you know, a million and a half, I think it's, it's easy to see that those living in District 2 are going to have a harder time of being in relationship uh, 
with their elected official. And remember, the presumption is that whatever the elected official is moving in policies is being informed by the constituents. So that relationship is super important, right? And so the census informs the drawing of our congressional maps numerically, as far as the population. It does the same thing because we st the, at the state level, Senate districts <clears throat> have to be as equal in population as possible as well for the same reasons. Same thing for the House districts. Same thing, believe it or not, for city wards, right? The question though there is who are the people living in these districts? So it's not just a matter, representation and how you draw these districts isn't just about counting heads. Yeah, that's part of it. That's a redistricting principle, right? That's part of it. It's also about what are the communities that live and thrive and work, right? And do business in these districts. What do they need? What are their you know, concerns? What are their recommendations? What is, you know, right? And so it becomes about more than just counting of heads as you're drawing these maps. And so when I say that the state of Minnesota, despite the census information communicating something different, the key there, the difference there is that because it's the courts that are drawing the maps, that's the rub. Because it's the courts in Minnesota that have been drawing the maps for the last 60 years, that baseline old map that I talked to you about earlier is the one they start with. They don't, they don't ask who lives there, who thrives there, who works there, who, right? That's not their role in the court. Their role as the court is to address the alleged constitutional issues that the litigants, that we raise within the litigation, right? And so they use what they call the least change approach to those models, right? So what that means that as they're drawing, as they're agreeing to what those districts should look like, they're asking themselves, is this the least change that we can make to these districts? And as I said before, in 10 years, I just talked to you about that example. I can start being Anastas Senator, I like Senator, Senator, you know, Anastasia Belladonna Carrera represents District 1 in Minnesota. But in 10 years, my district can look very differently, right? And so that's why the legislators, Senator Anastasia, should be in relationship with my district and saying, okay, let's look at this again. Who's living here? What do they look like? Where do they work? What are they, is it relatively young families? Are there a lot of children? Or is it older retirees? Why is that important? Because as a, as a senator, I may need to push different policies. I may need to focus on retirees and things that impact my retiree predominant right district and not like little babies and maybe what they need in daycare and that kind of stuff, right? It means that I'm representing that district. But if I, as the court, this is what's happened in Minnesota, that dynamic that you just saw me talk about is not happening because the courts only use least change. So they use the maps from what they just did now is they looked at the previous set of maps and said, okay, there's a change in population that we need to adopt and tweak a little bit to make sure that they're the same number of people in these districts. So what did we do last time? Oh, last time we did this. Well, if we move it a couple of blocks this way, what does that does? Oh, that gets me to it. Okay, let's go. We're going to roll with that. And what you notice is that there's a lot of op-eds that have been, if you Google it, I encourage you to Google it. I also have a list of resource sheets for you all to look at later. But you're hearing more and more Minnesotans saying, who was drunk when they drafted this map? Because, I'll give you an example, real life. If you look at CD7, yes, Congressional District 7. Congressional District 7, you ready for this? includes the border between Canada and Minnesota all the way down to Washington County and includes Stillwater. No, oh, you're talking about it, the part the of Minnesota district, that touches that District CD7 now re represents all those people. And just for those that may not be in Minnesota that are, that are watching us. Oh, So yes. that's further south. That's That literally almost runs that runs two thirds of the state's length in the far, 
north, all the way from the far northern border, all the way down to literally just the first ring suburb of the northeast side, right above St. Paul, the city of St. Paul. So, I mean, we're talking boundary waters. Do you think that those constituents up there have the same values, principles, concerns, needs? Then first ring suburb, Washington County and Stillwater, the town of Stillwater and all the business development that has been going on there booming, right? Same needs, do you think? But that's what happens when you don't have elected officials doing their job. So Miles, we have a question. Um, I think you touched on upon this earlier. Uh, the question is, you, they would like to hear from you about how Minnesota stacks up nationally on some of these issues, and I just um, appreciate the fact that we've kind of covered a lot of ground uh, on these issues, and I appreciate the caution that Anastasia had indicated to us about being careful about looking at some of the proposed legislation and from a vantage point that may push us to becoming um, not as receptive to people being able to have the right to vote. Um, so Miles, how, how does Minnesota stack up and sort of where are we situated? Well, I'll start by saying one interesting thing, which is that, uh, that maybe people in Minnesota are aware, but maybe they're not. But I think Minnesota is the only state in the country that has a divided legislature where one house is controlled by one party and one house is controlled by the other. The other 49 states, well, 48, because Nebraska is a, is a, a unicameral uh, a legislature, all of those are either Democratic or Republican. And Minnesota is the only one with a divided. So that's a very interesting little stack up uh, point right there. Generally speaking, Minnesota has stacked up extremely well vis-a-vis -vis other states. Minnesota is always one of the top um, five states, usually top one or top two. I know there was a little bit of con uh, uh, competition between Colorado and Minnesota last year, between the election director in Colorado and uh, Steve Simon, the secretary of the state here, uh, about whether Colorado was going to be first or Minnesota was going to be first. And Minnesota beat them by about four percentage points of turnout. So I've always been a fan of Minnesota. Um, so uh, the policies that Minnesota has had, has had historically have been, um, you know, open for people to be able to vote and to be able to participate. And so, you know, it was close to 80% turnout in the 2020 elections. But that gives me a, a chance to pose a challenge to, this, to the people of Minnesota. And that is that um, I think there's a policy that I want to, that probably people in the audience have not heard about. Uh, but I'm going to lay it on you now because I think it's really important. Uh, I have just writ co-written a book with a, a column, great uh, journalist and, and political columnist, E.J. Dion uh, of the Washington Post. And our book is called 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting. And the truth is that uh, Minnesota as, as the top and other states going down from that, but the United States stacks up very poorly against other countries. 66% turnout was a record, but in Australia, they have 90% turnout. They have 90% turnout in every election. Why is that? Voting is required. Voting is a requirement of every citizen. Just the way right now in this country, serving on a jury is a requirement of every citizen. If you're a citizen in this country and you are called for jury service, you are required to attend. We make the case in the book that people in, in, the, in this country, um, ought to be required to vote. And ought to be, it ought to be both a right, a fundamental right, which we think it is, but also a fundamental civic duty. And in the countries, there are 26 countries around the world where they use universal voting. And in, the, in, those, in those countries, turnout ranges from anywhere from 80 to 90%. And Anastasia can testify that if 90% of Minnesotans were, were voting, you would have a more fully representative group, a fully representative electorate. And in other states, it's even by far more the case. So I'm interested in challenging the people in Minnesota to see if they would be willing to take a further step to say that voting should be an act, a required act of citizenship for every citizen of Minnesota. And that's, uh, that would make, in my, in my book, that would make Minnesota the, the leading edge uh, by the way, we understand, EJ and I, as we put the book out, 
that this is a long-term fight and first reaction of people is going to say, what are you kidding? We don't do that here in the United States, but we do have people required to serve in juries. So I think that it's not as outlandish as you think. So I think it's a discussion whose time has come and what EJ and I are trying to do in the book, 100% democracy, the case for universal voting, is to just put this idea out on the table. Or in your hands, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> So a, a question for you, uh, this is the book. Um, appreciate uh, the opportunity to have an opportunity to read the book. Um, Well-written, appreciate folks uh, giving it time and consideration. Um, you made mention of the fact that there are some countries where, where it's mandatory, it's 80 to 90%. What happens to those citizens that don't vote in those countries where it's mandatory? Uh, it varies country by country. It's a good, very good question. Uh, and I'll use Australia as the example, because I think it's, you know, kind of analogous to the United States in many ways. First of all, uh, Minnesota adopted universal voting in 1924. So they have been operating with a, a kind of a mandatory participation system for almost 100 years. Uh, their turnout went from 60 to 90%. But here's the way it works. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll divide this in two parts. The actual technicality of the way it works is that um, the state makes every effort, the elect, the nonpartisan election commission of the of the country of Australia makes every effort to register people. And as of December of last year, 96.3% of people in of people in Australia were registered to vote, were on the voting rolls. Once you're on the voting rolls, it then becomes a requirement for you to vote. And almost everybody does. It's uh, kind of part of the culture. It has been part of the culture for a long time. But if you don't, you get a letter that says, hello, Anastasia, we've noticed that you're on the voting rolls, but you didn't vote. Can you give us an explanation? And if you write in and say, well, I was visiting my grandmother in Perth, or I felt sick that day, or I had to work an extra shift, that's all fine. If you don't respond at all, they will send you a second letter and say, Anastasia, you, you know, we really want to know why, how come you didn't vote? And if you don't respond again, you get a, 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 a $20 fine, uh, which in US dollars is about $14 right now. Um, and uh, very, you know, and, and that's, so that's the enforcement mechanism. But I wanna make it clear, our point is not to penalize people. What they have done through making it a requirement is that they've built an entire culture of participation. Uh, you know, everybody knows they're gonna vote, Everybody learns about the issues and candidates. All the schools do civic education. The political parties do, do education to make sure that everybody, all people, and they don't just do it to turn out their own voters. One of the most debilitating features, I think, of American elections are that you win by turning out your vote. Or in the worst case example, you win by, by um, you know, by uh, uh, what you call, by suppressing the vote of your opponents and figuring out ways to get them not to vote. In Australia, everybody's going to show up, everybody's going to vote. So you have to be talking to all the people all the time, persuading them that your way is the best. So they have what they have a very celebratory culture. They have what the, the nickname is, they have what are called democracy sausages. So that every polling place, there's a, a booth outside where nonprofit organizations are selling democracy sausages. People go, they hang out over every day. The whole it's it's on a Saturday, it's a national holiday. And they just have a very kind of positive and celebratory part political culture. We're a far away from that in the United States, as we well know. But I think that the, uh, the uh, one aspect of their culture is the idea that every citizen has a responsibility to vote. The same way in the United States, every citizen has a responsibility to serve on a jury. It really works. They've had 100 years of proof of concept. So I think it's worth a conversation in this country now. Uh, and I appreciate that that idea of us all having kind of a national holiday and then there may be some beer and sausage and other things that we might uh, like on a nice summer day to be able to vote. Uh, the question uh, though, please. Kevin, we, they, we have to have vegan options as well. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, question though for you, has universal voting in Australia resulted in higher levels of voter participation by Aboriginal uh, communities and non-dominant white communities? Australia? It's a, it's a good question. And Australia, like the United States, has had something of a tortured history, uh, contested history of voting. Uh, 
uh, Aboriginal people in Australia were not originally included in the franchise. Uh, it wasn't until, you know, it, it moved a little bit, but it wasn't until 1962 that Aboriginal people were actually granted the right to vote. And the, so their turnout has been uh, lower, um, but the turnout overall is, has been at 91, the last election was 91.3%. Uh, and that included a, a very strong majority of Aboriginal and um, kind of uh, other, other, other groups. There obviously, there are people who are homeless and they, they can't find, there's, there's cracks in the system overall, but overall it catches most people, it includes most people, and uh, generally speaking, it's been quite successful. From the audience here, what do the panelists feel about felony disenfranchisement, especially considering Miles' commitment to universal voting? Um, so for those individuals who've been formally incarcerated, um, there's differences within the states. So if one of the two of you could address and educate us about the differences that might exist on that issue. Anastasia, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll follow you, but you, you start off first. Thanks. I will say that this ties directly to something Miles spoke to uh, earlier, which is that in Minnesota, we're the only state in the country that has split government where we have the House and the Senate chambers controlled by members of the opposite um, party. And I say that because what we've seen is that although Minnesota has enjoyed, you know, amazing voter turnout and amazing um, voter registration, when it comes to disenfranchised communities, it could be communities of color or individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing is another group that I've been working with a lot on this and other disabled members of the disabled community. Um, it's not the same thing. It's not experienced in the same way. And, and the reason why I say that is because when you look at policies like Restore the Vote, which is essentially re-enfranchising individuals that have had uh, some type of felony conviction on their record. And most of us think of felony convictions within the, you know, within the uh, area of you know, rape, maim, and murder, and all kinds of horrible things. But the truth of the matter is that a lot of the folks that do have felony convictions is really a lot of times having to do with uh, damages to property that go to a certain extent. I mean, there's all kinds of other things that you can have on your record and, and why. Again, in Minnesota, you have very, unlike other states, you have a, a very high probation rate. So if Anastasia is convicted of a felony, I may only be in jail or maybe not, or in prison, maybe not even go to prison, but then be on probation for 20 or 30 years, which makes me ineligible to vote in the state of Minnesota because I have that conviction, right? So in Minnesota, what that means is that because of the split government, all of the types of pro-democracy policies that Miles also talked about a little bit before, are not moving anywhere. And that does have a specific demographic tied to it, right? Where, you know, the types of bills that are not making it out of the Senate chamber are not bills that necessarily impact white majority Minnesotans. They're bills that are specifically targeted and impact disparately young voters and people of color and other disenfranchised communities that I just spoke to you about. So although Minnesota does great, right, in meeting those high voter turnout rates and voter registration rates, it is still not the, this is why I keep saying, democracy is not experiencing, is not experienced the same by all voters. And Restore the Vote is just one example of many other policies that have been, you know, left in the wayside for at least, I'd say eight to 10 years now in the state of Minnesota, we haven't been able to, you know, something as no brainer as teaching children civics. Can you believe that? Teaching kids something more than just three levels of government. So that means teaching kids about what it means to be a senator, what it means to be a house rep. What do I need to be, what are the qualifications, right? How does that happen? What is, how do bills become law? How does local government work? All of that juicy stuff, is not, a, is not required. In fact, it is a component of social studies in the freshman year, but it's not taught. We support a bill, for example, that would teach juniors and seniors civics and have registering to vote part of that process, right? We couldn't get it past the Senate, though last year 
they supported the bill. Why? Because again, there's a new sort of a movement of special interest funding a specific type of policy package to keep certain demographics out of the vote. And I'd love to hear more from Miles because I know that he's got more juicy stuff on this question from a national perspective because it really is a movement that's going from a national perspective to really strategic, and this is very well, by the way, these, these things are very well strategically funded to move in states at this point. Kevin, let me let me go back to the 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 felony disenfranchisement issue if I can, and let me add a little bit to what Anastasia said. Um, first of all, the history of these laws that deprive people in in the uh, uh, to vote based on felony conviction it is a racist history. Most of these bills originated shortly after the Civil War, and what they were were um, uh, efforts to make sure that African Americans could not vote. Florida, 1868 was when it was in Florida, 1870s where, they, where these originated and they've been in effect ever since. Um, in two states, Maine, uh, Maine and Vermont, people never lose their right to vote. If you have a felony conviction, you can still vote. Uh, in Washington, DC, that's the case now, they passed that. In other states, it varies all the way from, you know, you can vote as, as, as soon as you get out of prison uh, in other states, you have to serve probation or parole and parole. In some states, probation is okay, but parole is not okay. Uh, it's a it's sort of a hodgepodge. I will say overall that there has been significant progress over the last 25 years. The states that have that previously had had permanent bans on voting mostly have repealed those so that people can get their voting rights back. In Florida, there was a constitutional amendment that was passed to restore the right to vote to people when they got out of prison, which is now being you know, uh, undermined by the legislature there. But in any case, um, you know, I think that part of what uh, a move towards universal voting um, uh, uh, requires is a more uh, progressive approach to people who have lost their rights to vote through a felony conviction. At a bare minimum, once you get out of prison, you should be able to vote immediately. And so therefore you, you uh, avoid the possibility that somebody is voting in violation of their of their of their status, but I think uh, you know in some cases like Maine and Vermont, it's the issue of whether you can vote is separated entirely from the issue of whether you have a felony conviction or not, and that, I think that's a trend towards the future. That if they have any questions, to make sure that they send them in. I'm also going to give the, the five minute warning here sign as well. Uh, our good folks, I think, at the University of Minnesota Rabina Institute, you can find out information about this issue in Minnesota. So if I'm on probation, I'm not eligible to vote. So uh, Minnesota falls into that category. Question for you, Anastasia. What do the panelists, what do, what do you think of being registered to vote when someone is born? What do I think about registering someone to vote when they are born, presumably born in the United States, or the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, which where I'm from. <laughs> I like that idea. Actually, I have never had anyone ask me that question before. But as I'm thinking about it, I love it because then it becomes part of embracing, you know, of our inherent individual power. It reminds me of, when I, when I heard that question, I just, it just sort of reminded me of my inherent value as an individual and as, you know, an American citizen. So why not? You know what I mean? It, it, just re, it just solidifies for me that value, that inherent value. And I kind of get excited about it because, you know, my job is to make sure folks get super stoked about going out to vote and stuff. And so if I can start them young, <laughs> why not? I'm here for you, Miles. How would a mandated voting requirement impact the right to refuse to participate? Uh, so the right to not vote as an act of civil disobedience. Right. It's a very good question. And we spent a lot of time uh, talking about it and thinking about it in the working group. And also we write about this in the book. Um, we uh, 
uh, the, the, the mandatory participation part does not extend to voting for a candidate or against a candidate. Um, we basically say that if you have a conscientious objection to, not, to voting, you can assert that. Uh, you can cast a blank ballot. You can cast a defaced ballot. In Australia, they call them donkey ballots. Uh, but we also propose that there should be a none of the above um, uh, uh, box on the ballot so that it is very clear that participating in the act of self-government is different from having to cast a vote for a candidate or another. So if you really have a principled objection to voting, uh, you can assert it. But we think that most of the reason that people don't vote is much more that it's just not part of the culture. So we're making it part of the culture, but you can opt out if you choose to. At least that, that's our recommendation for sure. Either of you. Um... If congressional districts depend on the census count, are you aware of any efforts to encourage census undercounts of particular populations? I will say this to that question. We're still learning more about what's actually been happening with the census in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, we're finding that there have been historic numbers of individuals of color that have been sort of left out as well. I know that in Minneapolis, when there was the count there, there, were, there was an investigation into a whistleblower allegation that they had been directed to sort of blanket, guesstimate you know, who people were in certain residencies. And, and there were unfortunately in residencies where you had a predominant of uh, individuals of color living in those areas. I mean, the census isn't perfect, but I think that that question really teases out an even more important question, which would be, um, you know, what could we do to make that process um, better in capturing, you know, as many folks as possible? We're never going to catch everyone, but how can we continue to work with our state demographers? How can we continue to work with the U.S. Census Bureau? I will say that I am hoping that 2016 was just like some anomaly um, and that uh, we're not once again going to be faced with the challenges of an administration whose intent was to intimidate certain demographics and certain groups within that um, census counting. I do, I will say this in the state of Minnesota, the census, the use of the census numbers is not, is not um, specifically required in the constitution of the state for redistricting but it's been a pattern, it's been a practice. And also I wanted to clarify this as well. The census is not the only information that the state of Minnesota, that the legislators whose job it is to draw maps, to redraw the maps, it is not the only information that they're able to utilize. So you are able to tweak certain areas better by using say state information and data. Kevin, let me just add one line to that very quickly. Sure. Uh, I really, I really just want to commend a common cause. They have been a real leading organization in making sure that the the census was counted and that there was aggressive efforts to sign everybody up. So I want to commend Common Cause and Anastasia. Please say hello to my good friend Karen Hobart Flynn when you get a chance to. In thinking about this uh, discussion and knowing the two panelists as I do, I know we could have talked for a lot longer uh, and given you even more information about the history of voting. I'm just disappointed I didn't get a chance to talk about counting uh, ballots from the Des Moines Register in a Senate race in 1932 in Iowa, but that will have to wait to another <laughs> time. Please, please help me thank our two wonderful guests, Anastasia and Miles today.